My name is Dr. Joshua Goldman. I'm a practicing plastic and reconstructive surgeon here in Las Vegas, and this is Med School Insider's Why I Did. I'm a full scope plastic and reconstructive surgeon, and that basically means that I do all aspects of aesthetic surgery as well as reconstructive surgery. On the aesthetic side, that could be breast enhancement, body rejuvenation, could be facelifts, neck lifts, rhinoplasty. On the reconstructive side, that includes everything, including oncologic, trauma, and congenital reconstructive surgeries. I do everything including burn and even peripheral nerve surgery. One of the things I specialize in and actually did a fellowship in is microsurgical reconstruction or free tissue transfer, meaning that I move pieces of tissue from one place on the body to another place on the body, very similar to a transplant. And that's a small subset of what we do in reconstructive surgery and what we call the top of the reconstructive ladder. My first exposure to medicine in general was really my mom and grandmother. They were both nurses and I would follow my mom to her job as a home health care worker when I was just a kid. So if I was sick home from school, I had to go to work with my mom um, while she would treat patients who were elderly and had diabetes or other home health needs. That mixed with the my parents' installation in us that part of our job as human beings is to help one another really led me into medicine. Growing up, I spent most of my time thinking that I'd either be a doctor or a lawyer. That's what most of my family friends and family were. So my father is in law and he steered me away from law. So naturally I became a doctor. In undergraduate study, I was exposed to a wide variety of career options, including working in solar or being a landscape worker. And in the 25th hour, I sort of had a quarter life crisis and considered going into finance or consulting. That's what a lot of my friends were doing at the time. But after spending a few days interviewing and seeing what the daily routine was like, I quickly retreated back to medicine. I didn't really want to move paper around and I didn't want my life to be solely based on making money. I wanted to have a direct impact on patient care and people's lives that I could see daily. Um, I obviously like money, but I wanted to find a way to change lives and uh, make a comfortable living in the same way. I will say there is an aspect of safety that played into that decision making. Medicine really is a mecca for the intelligent but risk averse in terms of building success and financial wellness. As time went on, I shed some of that fear and have focused more on the business aspects and growing beyond simple practice of medicine with an interest in innovations, device innovations, and building programs around healthcare to both build out what we can and to provide centers of care for our patients. When I look back, I had a great medical school experience. I did med school at Texas Tech University in West Texas, Friday Night Lights territory, both in Lubbock and Midland, and it made me a really great student to be out sort of in the middle of nowhere. I pretty much lived in the library. Med school grades at the time really adhered to that law of diminishing returns. So if you wanted honors, that meant spending 13 hours in the library. If you wanted to pass, maybe you could spend two to five. I remember looking at the NRMP match data and the published charting outcomes. And at the time, plastics was the most competitive specialty in terms of match rate. So I took all of the objective things from the charting outcomes data and I typed them out and I put them square in front of my desk where I sat so that I would see it every day and it would motivate me. Um, that was just a sheet of paper with things like average step one score, which at the time was around mid to high 240s. Now that seems sort of low as people have gotten better at step exams and now step one is even pass fail. I wanted to get honors in all rotations. I wanted to get Alpha Omega Alpha, the Medical Honor Society or AOA. I wanted research. Again, at least one publication meant significantly more interviews per the data. So that was one thing that I wanted to achieve. Gold Humanism Honor Society, GHHS. I wanted to be top of my med school class. I wanted to achieve excellent letters of recommendation from well-known surgeons. And I wanted to be involved in both volunteerism and leadership activities. I figured if I reached those goals for the most competitive specialty, I'd be fine for anything that I decided to do. Sincerely not knowing at the time that I would ultimately choose to be a plastic surgeon. So one thing I really didn't realize was the importance of connections in the field, particularly when it's a small world like plastic surgery. My school didn't have a program and I could have done more to connect to the world of plastics. And so now I regularly recommend for students that are at a place that doesn't have a program and they're concerned about matching, that they actually take a year at a major institution and perform research and spend time with the residents and faculty there. That way they have that networking opportunity. So I actually started out wanting to do hematology oncology and I did all of my undergraduate honors thesis in that. And then I went on to do research in both my first and second year summers in hematology and rare blood disorders. And then in my second summer, my mentor asked me to come to the clinic and I spent a few days each week in clinic with him and found that it really wasn't the subspecialty that I wanted to be a part of. I have all the admiration in the world for hematologists, oncologists, but um, life and death wasn't for me. And there was an aspect of trial and error that I didn't really enjoy. So my next step was really to look into other 
subspecialties and ones that were what I felt were happier. So when I looked into other subspecialties that I might want to be a part of, the, th the two things that really caught my eye were dermatology and orthopedic surgery. Dermatology, I really considered procedural or Mohs dermatology. Um, ultimately, I had too narrow of procedures for me and I wanted a wider scope. When I went and looked at orthopedic surgery, which a lot of my friends as athletes were going, to, were going into, um, it felt a little bit repetitive to me and a little bit algorithmic. Um, and I say that with, again, respect for my orthopedic colleagues, especially since my wife is one. Ultimately, I ended up matching into an integrated plastic and reconstructive surgery residency. There are two pathways. Um, there's an independent pathway where you go through general surgery first and then the integrated, which is a six year pathway where you start out as an integrated plastic surgery resident and you continue that way throughout. And I did that here in Las Vegas. I think generally residency is hard for anyone. By the end of residency, you're feeling the weight of student loans and the fact that your time really isn't yours, even more so than medical school. Your friends might be buying houses and starting families, and you're still sort of asking permission to go to the restroom from your attendings. So you sort of, just like you're still in elementary school, so you're sort of still feeling like a student, even though you're very much an adult. You may be taking home call and being woken up all night, and really your time isn't yours, and you feel like you're still waiting for your life to start, not realizing that really not much changes when you become an actual attending, and then you're in the next step, it can be still similar. As far as residency goes, I had a pretty great one. I got really good, well-rounded training. My program was a bit more clinical, I was able to bootstrap solid research and be productive in organized medicine as well, despite being at a relatively resource poor uh, program that again was more focused on that clinical side. And that's one thing that I would pay attention to when you're looking at residency programs. There are many that are very academic and there are many that are very clinical. And so you wanna be able to achieve your personal goals for your career and also achieve the things that are gonna get you in the next step. My co-residents were a really cohesive group. And since most of us didn't have family around, we were each other's family. And I still consistently recommend to people, both students and trainees, that if you ever have the opportunity to be around a positive support structure, then that will really benefit you throughout your training. If I were to have chosen another specialty, I probably still would go into dermatology and again, do a fellowship in Mohs dermatology or procedural dermatology, largely because it has the most crossover and a slightly better lifestyle than any surgical subspecialty. There are a lot of aspects of plastic and reconstructive surgery that I really love and that are all kind of components of why I went into the field. First, I like that many surgeons refer to us and that keeps our scope of practice incredibly wide. Literally yesterday, I did a submental liposuction for aesthetic purposes with some radio frequency skin tightening. And then I went back to the hospital in the afternoon and did a free gracilis, taking the inside of the thigh muscle and transplanting it to the ankle for coverage of hardware. I love that there is artistry and creativity and innovation in everything that we do. That allows us to continue to advance the field. One of the things that I loved when I first got into plastic surgery and I was a med student sitting down with a, a plastic surgeon and rotating with him was he told me about the principalization of plastic surgery. And what that basically means is that plastic surgeons learn a ton of principles and then just take those principles and apply them to all different types of situations rather than saying, this is the situation, this is the treatment. And that allows for a lot of latitude in how you approach different types of problem. When I look back on my decision to transition from oncology into plastic surgery, I'm reminded that we change lives most of the time. Occasionally we're a big part of saving them as well, but it's really the interplay between form and function and the psychosocial aspects of plastic surgery that sort of set it apart from other subspecialties. A significant portion of what I do is focused on not just the quantity, but the quality of a patient's life. And that allows you, or maybe even necessitates that you build a very special relationship with your patients. Understanding their individual desires and needs so that you can help them achieve their goals is very unique to plastic surgery, and I love that aspect of it. For microsurgery in particular, there's an excitement that goes along with the challenges and complexity that I love. So big defects, difficult places, without any particular right answer um, that is a consensus answer, always feels like trailblazing to me, and I love those procedures. And operating at the highest level of your specialty, knowing that you do something only a few hundred people in the world might do is a pretty awesome feeling. Just like any specialty, there's downsides as well. Some of my least favorite things about plastic surgery really first would be logistically. We do a lot of late closures for other specialties. So let's say surgical oncology is gonna take out a cancer or a tumor. That may take them until 5 p.m. and then I have to go and reconstruct that defect that they made or that hole that they made in the body. And so if my procedure is 
five to seven hours at and starts at 5 p.m. That means I'm doing a very late closure that night. I'm gonna be there last and I'll have to spend my morning coordinating whether I'm gonna do procedures or be in the clinic that day. I've been able to mitigate some of that by moving the pendulum uh, with the pendulum uh, to doing staged procedures. So we'll actually let the surgical oncologist do their job, either place a temporary dressing or a wound vacuum uh, dressing that will hold that patient over and we'll start fresh in the morning and do the reconstructive surgery that way. That allows us to keep things planned and to make my time more valuable and more usable. More globally, one of the things that's always bothered me about plastic surgery is actually the public misconception of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Even studies have shown that medical students don't fully understand the types of problems that we see or the scope of practice. In addition to that, Social media has changed that landscape a lot as well. And I just published a paper titled, The Scope of Plastic Surgery is Distorted Through the Lens of Social Media. On a day-to-day -day basis, I'm taking care of oncologic defects, traumatic defects, I'm transferring tissue, and I'll do huge reconstructions and patients will even come back to me and ask me, do you also do plastic surgery? And my answer is to be flabbergasted and say, well, what I did on you was plastic surgery. And so understanding that reconstructive surgery and aesthetic surgery are inextricably tied together is something that I feel like I'm always sort of educating people on. Even for me, throughout medical school, my perception of plastic surgery was heavily shaped by pop culture. So things like Botched and Joan Rivers and the Kardashians, that was what I knew of plastic surgery. And I would be lying if I didn't say that Nip Tuck and you know, plastic surgeons driving Ferraris around didn't play a little bit of a role in my decision to go into the field. But what ultimately hooked me was when I was transitioning from oncology to plastics was seeing if I could still have a footing in cancer. And I spent some time at Sloan Kettering and I watched a 23 year old with a rhabdomyosarcoma, so a malignant tumor of his palate, have that resected by head and neck and then have it reconstructed by the plastic surgeons who took a piece of his forearm and folded it and then hooked it up into blood vessels in his neck. They folded it so that it would have lining for both his maxillary sinus and his mouth. And that blew my mind. And I knew at that moment that that was what I wanted to be a part of. That drove my decision-making to go into plastic surgery. It was the reason that I pasted that piece of paper in front of my desk. And it really pushed me six years later to do a fellowship in microsurgery. Looking back is always interesting and hindsight's always 2020. When I do sort of think about my career, and what I would do differently, there's not much I would do from a choosing a subspecialty standpoint. I would definitely have obtained a little bit more business and innovations education throughout undergraduate and medical studies. Um, I think the entrepreneurial world is so far behind because doctors have always focused on patient care rather than pushing the field forward that the world is just wide open and ripe for innovation. So I think that that's an area where you can continue to grow and add a lot of value. Plastic surgery, because it's such a wide scope, has a lot of options. So there's a lot of different types of personalities even within the specialty. And you see that when you go to subspecialty meetings. I think generally people who are perfectionists that are both analytical but have a creative lilt are commonly attracted to the specialty. Because of the breadth of practice within plastic surgery, all types of people can go into and find their own subspecialty where they fit in. And you see those different personalities at different subspecialty conferences. I think generally speaking, people who are perfectionists that are analytical but have a creative leaning are commonly attractive to the specialty. So when I'm giving advice about either how to go into medical school, residency, or into your eventual career, and I'm talking to students, medical students or pre-meds, about how to pursue that specialty, my first recommendation is always spend as much time in the specialty as possible. And with different types of attendings, that could be employed practitioners, private practice, or even people in industry. So that you can see all of the different ways that medicine could be practiced. And then next, if you have the ability, attend conferences, and that way you're able to capture the entire world in one place, and you have the ability to network. That's a high value opportunity. You need to kill it on all your exams, all of your board exams, all of your clerkships, and all your rotations. The reality is you're gonna be competing against people who have done perfectly throughout their entire time throughout medical school, and you're gonna to need to be competitive with them. Take a year if needed for research at a major institution or a particular one you'd like to go to for residency. That again will allow you to network and it'll allow you to check off some of the boxes in the objective measures that you need to get matrixed into interviews. And then on a general and personal note, I think it's really important to recognize that surgery is a hard life and that is interesting or something you may seem now it will eventually be a job as you do it every single day, day in and day out. And if you don't continue to grow into it, 
it will get mundane. I really believe that what you choose to do with your specialty is much more important than the specialty you choose. So practice medicine, excel at your craft, and always be thinking about how you're gonna push it forward for healthcare, the entire field, for your patients, and for yourself, and execute those plans. But also choose life. It's really important to make a work-life balance that's going to work for you long-term and increase your longevity within medical school, within residency, and then as an attending physician. If you're a pre-med or medical student looking to become a plastic surgeon or any other type of doctor, check out medschoolinsiders.com.